All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. I'm Matt Emerson, and I'm one of the directors at CBR. I'm joined today by Luke Stamps, who's also one of our directors at CBR, and by Dr. Matthew Barrett, who's a professor of theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and our guest today on the podcast. Uh, if you don't know, CBR is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. And if you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at Baptist Renewal and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Baptist Renewal. And don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. Uh, in today's show, we're going to be discussing our next book on the CBR Reading Challenge, which is John Gill's The Doctrine of the Trinity. And as I mentioned, we have Dr. Matthew Barrett here as our guest today. Uh, Dr. Bar Dr. Barrett is a professor of theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's authored a number of books, including two at this point on the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, he also is very interested in John Gill in particular, and so we're glad to have you with us today, Matthew. Um, one of the things I, I want to mention before we jump in is that um, Dr. Barrett, Dr. Stamps, and I, uh, along with Dr. John Gill, were all the inaugural faculty at California Baptist University uh, in the online and professional studies division. We hope that John would be able to join us today. He's not feeling well, unfortunately. Um, but we wanted John Gill on to talk about John Gill and also for all the all four of us to be uh, back together. Uh, so hello, John, if you listen in afterward, we're sorry you, you can't make it. Uh, but this is kind of a reunion of sorts as well for us. So Matthew, we're glad to have you on today and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I just realized that most people who don't know who John Gill, the living John Gill is, may <laughs> think that you're actually in a weird way uh, talking <laughs> to, right yeah to yourself that's right yeah john is a living breathing person who we are friends yeah. with uh who is also a baptist historian yes he's just not yes. on the podcast today unfortunately wish wish he could be here and uh we'll miss his uh historical insight that's right uh, that's right well let's to get the whole band back together it but would have been fun maybe another time yep yep um so we'll just jump in. Um, could could y'all start us off by telling us a little bit about John Gill, who he was, when he lived, not the living John Gill, but the John Gill that <laughs> authored our book. Um, he was born in, yeah, he was born in uh, the Bay Area, uh, <laughs> 1975. Yeah, there you um, go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, why don't y'all tell us a little bit about John Gill uh, from the early Baptist life and uh, about just a general sense of who he was and what he was doing. Well, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, John Gill was, uh, well, I should probably start off by just saying that uh, it's really unfortunate that uh, so many Baptists today don't know about John Gill um, because he is, I think, in my mind at least, and I, and I, I think there's others, um, I think Timothy George, for example, would agree with me. Uh, I think John Gill is one of the one of the great uh, theologians of the Baptist tradition. Um, he comes out of the 18th century. He's actually born just um, at the end of the 17th century, but he comes into the 18th century. And uh, I think it's fair to say that both his preaching, his writing, uh, as well as some of his his controversies, uh, make him one of the more fascinating, controversial, but also uh, one of the Baptist figures of the 18th century that has the longest legacy, which makes it so strange that today we are so unfamiliar with him. Uh, Baptists give attention to a lot of different uh, theologians from the past, uh, but John Gill is not often one of them, and I think that's, that's really to our detriment. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I think that um, you know, Gill is, uh, a pa he's, pa he's a pastor for one. And so before we get into, you know, controversies or, you know, uh, some of his more uh, theological writings, we have to remember that he was a pastor uh, in London uh, during the 18th century and a remarkable preacher. And uh, his congregation 
it wasn't uh, one in which he merely preached, but uh, we have all kinds of documents giving us uh, a window into uh, his pastoral ministry. Uh, sometimes he's very frustrated <laughs> with those in his congregation. Other times he's, he, uh, you can tell he loves being a pastor. So he's a theologian, but um, he's a theologian with a pastor's heart. I would say in many ways, like John Calvin before him. Uh, he's also uh, not just a pastor, but he is a biblical exegete. And I think it's important to say that first. A lot of times his writing, his writings on, say, the Trinity or the doctrines of grace get attention. But John Gill was uh, a, not just a biblical exegete. He actually uh, made his, wrote a commentary, wrote many commentaries through the entire Bible. And I think I'm right in saying that not only was he the first uh, Baptist theologian to write a comprehensive systematic theology, but I think I'm right in also saying he's the first Baptist um, uh, theologian to actually write a commentary on the entire Bible. Um, yeah. So this really sets him apart in many ways. I, I think it's fair to say as a Baptist, he is a pioneer in that sense. Uh, of course, he's not just a Baptist. He's a particular Baptist. And so he is one of the most well-known in the 18th century, at least one of the most well-known defenders of, say, the doctrines of grace. Of course, in his day, though, that didn't just mean uh, defending what we today call the doctrines of grace. Uh, he was oftentimes doing so in a context that was strife, filled with strife uh, over uh, controversy between the particular Baptists and the general Baptists of his day. And that controversy certainly was over uh, issues like the doctrines of grace, everything from election to uh, effectual calling to perseverance of the saints and so on. But it was more than that as well. And I think that's important to recognize because, and we can talk about this in a minute, uh, when Gill enters into controversy over the Trinity, uh, it's also at times a particular versus general Baptist debate as, John, as Gill is very concerned that some of the general Baptists are refusing to subscribe to a creed, for example, or some of them are going so extreme, eventually to even end up in the Unitarian church. Right. Um, I, I could say a lot more. Uh, I'm sure we wanna talk about his, um, his document Trinity. I, I guess the other thing I'll just mention is he wasn't just a biblical commentator, but he was uh, quite the theologian. Um, he wrote what, what we call, I mean, it's short for this, but uh, his Body of Divinity, uh, which uh, was published in 1770. And this is a masterful uh, treatment of systematic theology in a very original sense. Uh, we, we just don't see a Baptist doing what he's doing. And, and so in that sense, I think he's really ahead of his time. I've often reflected on this and sometimes I, well I might step on some Baptist toes <laughs> here for a second but I think that's okay um, Baptists have sometimes not written as many systematic theologies at least in the last hundred years or so as in comparison to some other denominations Anglicans definitely Presbyterians and so on I think I think Gill would have that would just broke his heart <laughs> <laughs> because here he is uh, writing a systematic theology, and not only is it Baptistic, but I would say actually, first and foremost, from beginning to end, it is just littered with the church fathers, um, as well as the medi medieval theologians and scholastics, but especially the church fathers. Uh, it's a Timothy George once called uh, John Gill the true Catholic. Uh, Baptist theologian, and by that he meant Catholic with a small c. But I think his point is just that here is a Baptist very early on, and he's articulating the doctrine of the Trinity, but in a way that is very conversant, um, not just with the creeds, but with the church fathers before him, East and West, interestingly enough. And I think for that reason alone, um, well, he that's that's a pretty big motivation for us Baptists today to take him seriously and engage with him.
Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, on the point about him being an exegete first, um, as, as I'm reading through the book we're going to be talking about today, the Doctrine of the Trinity, you know, he's, he's deep into the exegesis of the Greek text uh, in quite a few places. So very serious about exegesis. Um, this is not, you know, the kind of typical shot that people take at systematic, that it's untethered from the Bible or whatever. Um, he clearly wants to demonstrate, and, and you know, <clears throat> similar to, to Calvin, uh, like you mentioned earlier, he's a, he's a pastor, but also he's somebody who wrote biblical commentary and then also wrote a systematic in order to sort of give shape and structure um, to yeah. that to that commentary. So lots of similarities there. Luke, is there anything you want to add about his life or his works? Yeah, we probably need to address <clears throat> in, a, in a little detail, not not too much here, but the, some of the um, the controversy. The thing that if most people, most Baptists, if they know anything about John Gill, um, they think of him as a hyper Calvinist. And uh, that's sometimes debated whether or not that title uh, or that that term should be applied to Gill. Um, I, I, I'm convinced with our, our friend Michael Haken that it probably is a fair description of, of Gill's uh, writings. Uh, so hyper-Calvinism, uh, for those who don't know, it's not just uh, a Calvinist who's really hyper. Um, I think that's sometimes how it gets understood. Uh, but but it's, it's sort of going even beyond um, you know, the traditional doctrines of Calvinism on, on soteriology, um, where, you know, in, in the, so late, in later generations, there were, there was a group known as the Gillites, uh, in, among British Baptists who were anti-missionary, right? So the idea in hyper-Calvinism is, is that, um, God will save the elect without our help, um, that we, basically, we, there's no, um, you can't offer grace to people uh, they're, they're, because only God gives grace. Not everyone has a duty to believe the gospel uh, and so on. Um, so I think what, the, I mean, I'm, I'm not the expert on Gill. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what Dr. Haken would have to say about this. I know one of our other professors at Southern, Dr. Nettles, disagrees with Haken on whether or not Gill is uh, a hyper-Calvinist, but I see it in a couple of different places. You do see uh, this notion, especially of eternal justification, the idea that um, the the elects are are not just justified in time, but they're eternally justified in virtue of their election, which is kind of a hallmark of of this notion of of uh, of hyper Calvinism, at least as it, it as it sort of gets played out, right? So anyway, we could say more about that, but I I think uh, one of the things that I um, try to encourage uh, my own students to do and others is don't let that scare you away from Gill. I think we can acknowledge that Gill uh, was, was wrong, like really wrong on that. Uh, all right. So I think, I think when you get, uh, if you, if you take Calvinism to the conclusion that not everyone uh, has a duty to believe and that we shouldn't uh, offer the gospel to people, anyone, anywhere who can be saved, then that's a problem, right? And we, we want to acknowledge that um, and avoid that. But at the same time, if you if you let that keep you from the riches of Gill uh, that, that Matthew has been uh, expounding on, all of his biblical commentaries, uh, the body of practical, uh, of, of doctrinal and practical divinity. Another uh, text that was, a, that, was, that was very influential was his commentary on the Song of Solomon. Um, and this particular text that we're looking at here, the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, man, you're just going to you're going to cheat yourself out of a lot of riches here if you let that very important. Right. It's a very important uh, caveat to make about Gill, but don't let it keep you from appreciating his broader legacy. Yeah, I, if I could just add to that, um, and I, I think that's really well said, Um oftentimes it, it doesn't matter whether it's a, um, a college student, a master's student, or sometimes even a PhD student. Um, as soon as John Gill gets brought up, they will always turn to me and say, yeah, but what, didn't he believe in eternal justification or didn't he, wasn't he a hyper Calvinist? And um, oftentimes it's that question is asked immediately, uh, not so much because the person's so much concerned about that, <laughs> but because they want to, uh, dismiss guilt mm -hmm. and, and just say, oh, well, we, we can't listen to them. 
So I, I think really the issue isn't guilt. Uh, the, the issue is how do we understand and appreciate uh, history with humility, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's actually the issue. It doesn't matter whether it's Gill or someone else. Um, certainly there's strong disagreements with people, with individuals of the past, but I think C.S. Lewis is so helpful here when he, you know, he warns against chronological snobbery and says that, uh, well, yes, they had faults in the past, but they, they weren't necessarily our faults. And, and so I think that's wise. Gill, I think we should approach him with that same type of humility. You know, I, I think your, your point's well said. Um, one of the reasons why there's debate over how, I, I, I would say at least, um, well, there certainly is debate. Okay, is Gill a hyper-Calvinist or not? But once we move past that, there's, there's also debate over, okay, to what extent and that sort of thing. Um, the, you mentioned the, the Gillites, um, which is a, uh, maybe not the most attractive, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> label for your followers, but so be it. Um, they, they were sometimes quite eager to say, we're not going to offer the gospel in our preaching freely. We're not, we're not going to give the free offer of the gospel, as it's called. Um, some historians... I think Timothy George is one of them. I, it would be fascinating to see if, you know, what, what Michael Haken thinks about this. I, I should ask, I need to ask him about this I, sometime because I, I think Timothy George makes the case that um, Gill was uh, was willing to offer the gospel very freely in his preaching and did so. Um, so, but at the same time, I think there is a very valid point that on the doctrine of eternal justification, he, he does seem to go there and he does seem to commit himself uh to that to that belief uh but all that said yes i i think that on the one hand even with the doctrine of grace we can still greatly benefit from gill i mean his massive work <laughs> it is massive um on the doctrines of grace is uh maybe one of the most definitive i know we always think of john owen when we think of you know a case for say definitive atonement, but here is a even a more comprehensive uh, case for the doctrines of grace, uh, and, and it's right from the pen of John Gill. So that's where we need to use wisdom and just recognize, okay, yes, when it comes to justification, I I might have a strong disagreement with him, and that's that's okay. That's that's good to have that disagreement, and we should. And then simultaneously, we can turn around and <laughs> Gill can say something else about grace that. Uh, we are going to amen, you know, over and over again. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, particularly in terms of uh, a kind of eat the meat, spit out the bones approach. Um, with Gill, there's so much meat in his doctrine of the Trinity, um, which is where we want to turn next. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the book that we're discussing today, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. And of course, he also talks about the Trinity in, in a body of divinity, um, obviously. But uh, here we're dealing with just this treatise on the Trinity. So, uh, Matthew, do you want to give us just a, a broad overview of the way that he argues or articulates uh, the doctrine of the Trinity in this book? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because he, he wrote this, uh, I think, in the 1730s. Uh, and... I think the first thing we need to recognize is that oftentimes Gill's works are not, they're not written in a vacuum. Uh, For example, uh, there is a lot of Trinitarian controversy that's occurring, Mm -hmm. uh, which I find in in one weird way uh, comforting because sometimes we look at our own day and think we, we can be discouraging, right? We look at our own day and think, how are we ever going to, well, it's not new in, in Gill's day. He's shocked. He, he can't believe it that even in bap, Baptist circles, maybe especially in Baptist circles, he is having to convince mm. churchgoers and pastors who he thinks should know better. He's having to convince them to subscribe to, say, the Nicene Creed. Right. <laughs> Some things don't change, I suppose. And and so Gill is distraught and uh, he even, it is pastoral for him. Uh, there's one point where he uh, disciplines a, a church member for rejecting eternal generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think 
that would be so foreign to us today. Uh, right. I mean, we might discipline someone for sexual immorality, for example, but for a doctrine and let alone a doctrine, that would be so, I mean, you would have to first sit down and explain what is eternal generation to them. But right. in Gill's day, he understood, no, this is at the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. All that to say, um, he, eternal generation in particular, was was close to his heart because, not just for the pastoral reasons, but because he realized if we remove this doctrine, we don't have a doctrine of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he says at one point um, in his book, well, this he, he says this also in his body of divinity. He says at one point, how else would we know that the father is father and the son is son? Right. It's almost like Gil is saying, if, if you remove uh, this historic doctrine, which he also thinks, thinks is, a, is a very biblical doctrine, he makes an exegetical case there. Right. You have to remember, Gil's very unique. Uh, it, it, like 10 and 12 years old, he's learned Greek, he's read the Greek New Testament, and he taught himself Hebrew. So he's, mm. very, he's, he's not like anyone else in that sense. So he's making an exegetical case, but simultaneously, uh, he's making a theological case to say, if if we um, don't articulate uh, the doctrine of of eternal generation in a way that that is faithful to both scripture and creed, uh, Gill is convinced we will end up um, either civilian or uh, unitarian. Right. Um, and this isn't theoretical for him. He knows people. Uh, in the general Baptist camp, for example, who started to question subscription to the creeds. They started to question, say, simplicity. Mm-hmm. Uh, they started to question eternal generation. And and eventually, not all of them, but eventually Gill just lamented because they ended up leaving uh, Christianity all, altogether, at least historic confessional Christianity. So this is right. some of the background yep. that's coming to play um yeah i mean let me, aside. yeah let me jump in just for just a second um i think it, it might help our reader or our listeners to uh, know that salters hall the controversy at salters hall was 20 years prior to him publishing this book and i mean so that's a, a fairly short amount of time in other words where the controversy was specifically with the general baptists and whether or not they should subscribe to the nicene yeah. creed and and it's over the doctrine of the trinity because uh, people like Matthew Caffin among General Baptists had essentially been adopting uh, Socinianism, which is, is all kinds of funky. But one of the things it does is it rejects the divinity of Christ. Um, it's, a, it's subordinationist. So, um, yeah, there's a lot going on immediately prior to Gill writing this book um, that yeah. that, you know, especially General Baptists had been dealing with. Um, throughout the 17th century and then into the 18th century. So just wanted to, to throw that quick point in there about some of the context. I also just want to say for the record that Matt Emerson said funky, which warms <laughs> my, my Californian heart. Right, there you go. <laughs> that's uh, the official academic term for the yeah, Socinians. That's right. Yeah. I should start funky. saying, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> That'd be even more Californian. There you go. For your yeah. guys, that's, that was always my, my yeah. favorite. Are we going to have this at your guys' house? We are. Just say, just say y'all's. Are we going to have this barbecue there? at your guys' house? No, we're going to grill out at y'all's house. Oh, Don't man. get me started. Don't get me started. Uh, honestly, we're getting way off topic, but honestly, I have these crazy dreams about moving back to California, and it is like I feel at peace in my heart. It's very strange. <laughs> I'm not going to move to California. I don't want to move to California, but in my dreams, I go back to California. Okay. Anyway, so uh, Gill is responding to lots of controversy um, and lots of really bad Trinitarianism that's happening yeah. at the time. So, yeah. So, and uh, as he writes this book, you know, what struck me, and you may have been about to say this, Matthew, before I interrupted you, but what struck me is that it's just a very standard kind of argument, which is you start with the oneness of God. There is only one God, but this God exists in three persons and then proving the divinity specifically. I mean, he does start with the divinity of the father, um, but he goes into the divinity of the son and the spirit. And it's a very common kind of way to argue it, which is to say, uh, 
the, the son and the spirit share in the same names, actions, attributes, and worship. And, and I've, I've chosen to alliterate that because I'm a good Baptist. So uh, the son and the spirit share in the actions, attributes, adoration, and appellations of the father. Um, <clears throat> but when you dig into that, as you were saying a minute ago, when you dig into that, how do you distinguish between the persons then? And the only, the only theological, biblical way to do that is via the eternal relations of origin. And, and Gil obviously uh, articulates that as well. So, you know, just in terms of the outline, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking as I read this, this just is the, the classic doctrine of the Trinity. And that's not to say there's nothing unique or, or interesting about it, but it is to say that and we'll come back to this in a minute, it is to say that early Baptists were not immune or neglectful of classical Christian doctrine, especially with respect to the Trinity and Christology. And we we kind of hammer this point in every podcast episode we have, but here it is again. Um, Early Baptists, many early Baptists, you know, we talked about Benjamin Keach in the last episode. We've talked about uh, Thomas Monk, um, they were they were keen to connect what they were doing with what the Christian tradition had been doing uh, at that point for 1500 years. So that, that was that was my thought as I looked at the outline. Yeah. And it, I, I'll say the same thing I said about Monk, about Gill, uh, again, because I just think we can't emphasize this enough um, that Gill, obviously, as Matthew said, is is as both Matthews have said, is is primarily dealing with the biblical text, like exegesis of particular biblical texts and weighing like different readings of, of different texts. And sometimes he's he's more confident that a particular text is pointing in a Trinitarian, you know, as a, as a proof for the Trinity and, a, and he's more circumspect in other times. So he's just a careful exegete. But the other thing to note about it is that the, the book is littered with references to the church. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really remarkable given the fact that Gill, because he was the son of a Baptist, was kept out of university education in the 18th century and had to teach himself uh, mm. Greek and Hebrew and Latin and the church fathers. And he's quoting these guys in untranslated Latin and Greek uh, footnotes from the church fathers. And so I just think that we have to just stand in, in, in great respect uh, for, for what Monk did among the general Baptists and Keach and others uh, among the particular Baptists in the 17th century, and Gill here in the 18th century, uh, as dissenters uh, who, again, did, didn't have the same access to, to university education, but who were teaching themselves not only the biblical languages and the truth of scripture, but also the rich heritage of the church fathers. Yeah. And I just think that's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, I do as well. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, when I was when I was writing my book, simply Trinity, um, the the editor asked me at one point, "Why do you keep Why do you keep quoting John Gill?" Mm. <laughs> and I actually had to take out <laughs> lots. Of, I have a document in which I <laughs> took out and just I have a whole document of just Gill because uh, the reason I mention this is because um, I discovered not only is he exegeting scripture. Not only is he quoting the church fathers, but but Gill is in a sense a channel for us, right? Uh, maybe a bridge would be a better uh, you know illustration here. Um, and this is why I kept going back to him. The more and more I write on the train, I, I I have my eyes on a number of people, but Gill is one of them because uh, he's a bridge back and forth, so that as we are dealing with some of the same issues that Gill dealt with in his day, very typical objections to the Trinity from from a biblicist mindset, for example. Gill is very aware of those. Uh, He experienced those, but he's a bridge because then he takes us back um, and and he is conversant by his own self-education, which is remarkable. Um, He's very conversant with the fathers, not just how they exegeted the text, but also the spirit in which they then put forward their theological argument. So, so maybe mm. I can just give like a concrete example for a minute here. Yeah. Um, because it, it, I, I, this is not original to me, um, though I, I've 
put these forward in my book. Um, this is this is <laughs> I'm I'm just uh, staying on the shoulders of Gil at this point. Uh, but at one point, Gil is it's really quite genius. Okay, he's trying to defend uh, eternal generation. Um, and and just to quote him here at one point, he says, uh, "Eternal generation is the distinguishing criteria of the Christian religion. Without this doctrine of the Trin without it, the doctrine of the Trinity cannot even be supported." So you get a sense there for how important he thinks this is. Right. So then, how does Gill how does Gill then teach his readers what eternal generation is and what it is not? Right. That's the million dollar question. I always get that question when I'm teaching. Okay. What is this exactly? And the, what I usually respond with is, well, let's talk about what it's not, mm -hmm. uh, because that'll actually keep you from a number of heresies. <laughs> but it also it also clarify for you what eternal generation is all about. So what Gil does at that point is he goes to Gregory of Nyssa. Mm -hmm. um, and Gil himself is indebted at, at this point. And he says, well, eternal generation this doesn't involve when the father begets the son. This doesn't involve a division of nature. Uh, it mm -hmm. also doesn't involve a, a multiplication of the divine essence, which would, for Gill and for Gregory, would undermine divine simplicity. Um, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. And this is a big one. It there's no um, there there's there's no priority, mm -hmm. and, and therefore there's no inferiority or hierarchy. And then he goes on to talk about how, and this might be a little bit strange to some of our readers, our listeners, because he starts to get into divine attributes, but he says, in eternal generation, and again, he's building off of Gregory, he says, you do not have any type of mutation that takes place. There's no mutation. There's, there's no motion. Um, what he's trying to say is there's no change in God. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, since there's no change, there cannot be any corruption, right? That's what, what he's really afraid of. Um, he goes on from there to talk about other things as well, but um, this has been so helpful for me as I've been thinking about the Trinity, because oftentimes the objections we hear today against a classical doctrine of the Trinity or something as specific as simplicity or eternal generation, well, they're not all that different from what Gill is experiencing. And here's, an, here's a model of someone who's able to on the one hand, uh, affirm these doctrines, explain them, uh, but in a way that doesn't compromise either one, which I think is, is maybe part of the problem today is in an effort to affirm one in a certain way, we compromise the other. Gill is a great example for us of how to actually keep right. all these doctrines in hand without forfeiting any one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And just on that, Go ahead, Luke. Um, I thought that same uh, passage was really relevant for today's controversies over the Trinity, that eternal generation sonship doesn't imply priority and posteriority. And another word he uses is dependence. dependence. You know, I think for a lot of people, like that's the vision of the Trinity that they've gotten is that the son is kind of eternally dependent on the father. And I mean, in one sense, we might say he is in, in terms of, you know, his, the, the person of the father generates the person of the son. But in terms of any kind of essential dependence or hierarchy, uh, that's just not what these biblical words <clears throat> mark out. Father and son don't mark out authority and submission, but origin and generation. And I, I mean, that's that's perfectly consistent with what the tradition has said. And here we have a Baptist example of that kind of careful biblical synthesis. Yeah, and there, I mean, there's a few things to point out there. One of them is the, you know, what Gill is doing, as I, as I said earlier, is the same thing that Athanasius did and Gregory of Nyssa did and Gregory of Nazianzus and all the rest of the pro Nicenes, which is to say, if you place division within the Godhead with respect to anything else other than the eternal relations of origin, you have fundamentally divided the Godhead into yeah. separate gods. Yeah. And eternal generation and eternal procession of the spirit are there. The eternal relations of origin is therefore the linchpin of Nicene orthodoxy. And you can't get Nicaea without eternal relations of origin. Um, so Gill is just, I mean, you know, in the 1700s, standing in a long line of the same kind of argument since the 300s. 
Um, and even before that, you know, because Tertullian was was arguing for something like the eternal relations of origin, even though he may not have used the exact terms um, earlier than that. So, and origin as well. Uh, so, you know, this is, Gil is, is standing on the shoulders of, of giants here and is a giant um, in, in his own right. I think another thing to, to point out is that, um, you know, with respect to current controversies, there is a sense in which the, the tradition uses subordination or authority to talk about the eternal relations of origin, but it is in a, in a, it's in a completely different sense than what theologians today mean when they say that the father is eternally, you know, authoritative over the son or something like this. It's, it's completely in reference to the eternal relations of origin. And so there is a sense in which, you know, a term like octoritas can be used by say Thomas um, to, to describe the eternal relations of origin where the father has some kind of authority or primacy or whatever, but it's only in the sense of this, this eternal relation of origin that's eternal. And it's just who God is in himself. It has nothing to do with kind of a distinction of attributes where the father has more authority or, or whatever. And what Gill is helpful in saying is it doesn't even mean there is priority to the father. It just means we can use those kinds of terms to describe the relations between the persons um, and their relations of origin, not relations of authority and submission. So, I mean, it's all, it, to me, it, like, like you've said a number of times, both of you, it's very relevant to um, some of the debates today. And it's relevant because Gill is careful. And I, I think that's what's important. There, there's a, there's a yeah. kind of carefulness that has to exist with our language. We can use these terms in this sense, but not in this sense. And that's where the lines have all been blurred today, I think, um, where we need clarity and we have, um, we have a lack of clarity. So Gil is really helpful. Yeah. If, if I could, um, just add to that and, and and again, give a, um, a quotation here, it's just short. So I I won't, uh, you know, try the patience of our listeners, but, um, uh, one of the reasons why Gil can do just what you said, right. And, um, avoid any any type of um of hierarchy uh within god well one of the reasons he can do that and be so careful to avoid that mistake is because he has in place a very strong uh, connection in his own mind between these eternal relations of origin and and simplicity right so uh, I, I'm assuming our, our listeners are familiar with the doctrine of simplicity that, that God's without parts, mm-hmm. uh, he's, he's indivisible, etc. Well, how does this work for, for Gil? Well, maybe, you know, we use a, a phrase like eternal relations of origin. Gil would also use a phrase that comes actually, again, this is, <laughs> I'm going to probably step on some toes here, but for those Baptists who are uh, nervous or scared about Thomas Aquinas, Gill does not have that hang up. Uh, right. So here's a phrase that comes right out of the Thomistic tradition, modes of subsistence. Mm-hmm. And Gill is completely unembarrassed. He is not hesitant at all to use it. But but notice here in this quote, how he then connects um, any, everything from, say, eternal generation to eternal spiration with the spirit to the one indivisible simple essence that father son and spirit have in common he Mm. says this he says there is but one divine essence undivided and common to father son and and spirit and in this sense but one god since there is but one essence though there are different modes of subsisting in it which are called persons and these possess the whole essence undivided yeah yeah it's almost as if Gill is, and again, this sounds just like the Cappadocians does it. As soon as he talks about the three, mm-hmm. he, he immediately circles back around to say, yes, but they have the one undivided simple essence come. And then as soon as he's talking about uh, how indivisible this essence is, he, he immediately That's right. turns to say, well, how then is this, how then does this essence subsists and so so he and then he starts talking about father son and spirit i think you know you talked about being careful i think that is 
for some people that feels uncomfortable because it feels like attention. But if, if we are going about Nicene Trinitarianism in the right way, as I think Gil is, that is a necessary circular movement right. to make to make sure you are not compromising either. And in this case, with hierarchy, it's really easy to do so if we, if we don't say, as Gil does here, well, yes, there, there's different modes of subsisting, but they possess the same whole undivided right. essence and with it, all the attributes yep. uh, that we ascribe yeah. to God. It, it reminds me of, I think it's in Basil's On the Holy Spirit, where he's talking about um, the numerical way to talk about the Trinity. And he says, that, you know, there are one, two, and three, but they're really just one, right? Um, so it's the same kind of, kind of thing where you're saying, yes, there are different modes of subsist subsistence, but it's one essence. Yes. In one sense, we can talk about first the father, then the son, then, then the spirit one, two, three, but it's also just one. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's really a tutorial in just classical Trinitarianism, but, you know, one of the things I want to emphasize, um, as we kind of come to our last bit here is, that all of this is very exegetical, right? So we've said that a few times that Gill really cares about articulating what he's saying from scripture. Um, in doing so, and this is another thing we've emphasized about a number of our um, reading challenge books this year, is in doing so, he reads the Bible in ways that are reminiscent of kind of classical interpretation as well. So classical Trinitarianism mm -hmm. goes along with classical interpretation. So an example of this, uh, and this is in the, the text that's linked on the website. Uh, so for me, this is page 122. Um, and he's in the middle of talking about uh, the deity of the word. Um, he says, you know, if, if therefore I prove that Jesus Christ is called Jehovah or Yahweh, or that this name is given to him, I prove him to be the most high God, which will be best done by comparing some texts of scripture in the old with others in the new Testament. And so you think, okay, yeah, if you prove that Jesus is called Yahweh, then we're good to go, right? And you think, and you know, if you just pause there and go, what text is he going to bring up first? I mean, I don't know what you guys think, but I'm thinking like, all right, maybe he's going to Philippians 2. I don't know. But he starts with, he goes, with Exodus 17, verse 7, and he called the name of the place uh, Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord or Jehovah, saying, is the Lord or Jehovah among us or not? From hence, it plainly appears that he whom the Israelites tempted in the wilderness was Jehovah. Okay, so he says, Israel tempted Yahweh in the wilderness. Um, and yet nothing is more manifest, he goes on to say, than that this was the Lord Jesus Christ. As is evident from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. And if so, then Christ is Jehovah and consequently the Most High God. So he starts with this story about, uh, uh, about Israel in the wilderness in Exodus 17 and says, this is how Yahweh is described in Exodus 17. And then goes to 1 Corinthians 10 and says, look, Paul says that was Jesus. Paul says that was the son um, in, in Exodus 17. So it's a very kind of classical mode of interpretation where the referent of scripture just is the son um, because the son is the image of the father who we see through the testimony of the spirit. And that's just the way he reads the Bible. So uh, all, all of what he's saying is very biblical um, and it's biblical in the same kinds of ways that the early church made biblical arguments, which is to say, it's, it's much more, uh, it's a much more robust way of reading than a kind of truncated, overly modernized approach to biblical interpretation that we see a lot of times. Yeah. And I think these two things we've been saying about Gil are not really, in one sense, they're not really two things. Like we're saying like he's deeply biblical, careful exegete, and also committed to the tradition. Like sometimes people, when they hear folks like us talk about recovering a sense of tradition, I think they, they might mishear what we're saying. We're not saying that there are two sources, right? So we have the Bible and then we go to St. Augustine or whatever. No, we have the Bible as our, as our source. But these other uh, voices from the past, we're also studying the Bible, right? So that 
the, the deeper we go in the tradition, the closer we get to the Bible, because these are people who are uh, thinking carefully and deeply with uh, lots of missteps along the way, but also lots of um, momentum and gains. And, and so you can sort of, the, the tradition sort of tries certain ways of synthesizing the biblical material and kind of sees where that leads and then find better paths. And so we're, we're actually not appealing to, Gill's not appealing to these, to these authors uh, as a kind of authority in their own right. He's just simply saying these are guides to understanding what the scriptures say. And he really does roam uh, widely in the tradition, everywhere, ever, everywhere from like very early authors like Ignatius and Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and Tertullian to St. Augustine. And I'm really grateful that Matthew pointed out he's also, I, I don't know that he quotes uh, Aquinas anywhere, but he certainly uses Thomistic language, the modes of subsistence, the suppositum. I mean, there's all kinds of Thomistic language that comes through. Um, again, not because he endorses everything that any of these authors say about every single topic under the sun, but because this is the heritage of, of the history of exegesis. He's concerned about the biblical text as the authority. And if you're okay. concerned about the biblical text, you're going to be concerned about the ways in which the Holy, the Holy Spirit has illuminated the minds of believers down through the centuries as, as they have wrestled with these texts. So those extra biblical terms that we're using are not uh, somehow supplementing something that's deficient in the Bible, but they're simply a time-tested ways of interpreting and synthesizing all that the Bible has to say. I know I'm getting a little impassioned here, but I think I, I want to make sure people don't misunderstand what we're saying. We're not saying... Unlike uh, God, who is impassable. Just to be clear. Okay. Continue. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> That's right. We're not, saying, yeah. we're, not, we're not saying let's all become capital C Catholics and see the tradition as some somehow yeah. on par with the Bible. We're simply saying... The deeper you go in the tradition, the closer you get to the to the scriptures, because this because the the history the, the history of, of doctrine is simply the history of interpretation of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. If I, I, I everything that you know, both of you just said, um, I, I think Gill would be you know really thankful for um, to to just maybe uh, elaborate a tad, um, you know, to your point. Matt, the, the, the point about the way Gill approaches the scriptures, the way he interprets the scriptures, and, and how that brings him to the Doctrine of Trinity, I think that's a really crucial point. Your, you know, your example, he, he does that even with Old Testament texts. Um, I, I would add, one of the, the great ways that he does this is with the gospel itself. Um, he has this, uh, it's one of my favorite moments uh, when he's, he's talking about the Trinity. He, he, I'm paraphrasing him, but he essentially says, you know, I get accused that I'm, I'm just uh, speculating. And uh, he says, no, he says, I'm not, this isn't speculation. Uh, he, he says, the Trinity uh, brings us into the whole uh the whole work of salvation. And then he goes further and he says, and all of the doctrines of the gospel. Mm. Well, what does he mean? I mean, I think what he means there is on the one hand, the, the Trinity comes to us and, and it's revealed to us um, through the gospel itself. And so mm. in that sense, Gil thinks, well, uh, th this isn't just me appealing to tradition. Like this is, this is the very, uh, this is the very heartbeat of the scriptures, of the very story of the scriptures. As they, they give us the gospel of our salvation, they are also opening our eyes to this trinity. Right. But he goes further than that. He even says it's not just the gospel, it's, it's all the doctrines related to the gospel. And so I think he's starting to, to think through, okay, how does, how does the, the big picture of my entire salvation, how does that manifest the trinity? Well, that's a very natural move. Right. I mean, this is we, if, if we're approaching the, you know, the Trinity in a, in a very uh, uh, pedagogical manner, we, we might say, well, of course, as we are, are brought into contact with um, the mission of the sun, for example, mm -hmm. it's very natural. It's very fitting for us to then our eyes to be moved upward to then contemplate, well, who is the sun? What does right. it mean for him to be begotten from the father and not just son in the incarnation, but begotten? from all eternity for Gil, he is 
really eager to help his churchgoers understand that connection so that they don't think, oh, you know, that Orthodox Trinitarianism, that's just speculation from the tradition. Right. Gil, Gil, that is just a completely foreign dichotomy to Gill. For him, um, those two things go hand in hand. Of course, he sees scripture as his final authority, but he is paying attention to uh, those of the past who've commentated on scripture to help him see mm. how the gospel mm. brings him into touch with, with the Trinity itself. That's right. And if you read his later work, the, the, the body of doctrinal and practical divinity, um, the, the Trinity is everywhere in that text. Yeah. It's not just, I mean, there is a, a, a very helpful section on the Trinity itself, but in each of the divine attributes, he talks about how each of the divine persons possess that attribute. Again, thinking, thinking of, of the doctrine of divine simplicity, that it's not like they're, they're each gets kind of a part of, you know, the, of the divine essence. No, each of the divine persons is the divine essence and has all of those attributes. Uh, and it, his, even when he talks about propitiation, he talks about um, the doctrine of the atonement. He's talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. How does this work? Uh, who, who is the one who's being satisfied? Very interesting passage there where he says it's actually all three. It's not just the father who's being satisfied in the death of Christ, but it's, it's the son as well, because the son subsists in the divine essence and is God equal with the father. When he talks about the divine decrees, um, there's this beautiful chapter at the end of the, the section of the divine decrees where he just kind of takes a, he kind of takes a, an aside and says, now let's talk about what God would have been like even if there were no creation. Yeah. And he, he takes an entire chapter to talk about what, what he calls the complacency and delight of each of the divine persons with the others. Yeah. And so the Trinity is just shot through the entire text. So it's not, as you, yeah. as you point out, Matthew, it's not just like some... Here's this kind of addendum to the Christian faith that you can get to whenever you graduate to that level. But let for the rest of us, we'll stay down here. No, the Trinity is worked through the whole the whole cloth. Yep. Well, uh, it's been a great discussion. We're we're out of time. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us today. We're grateful for you and for your work and for uh, the conversation today. And I'll close us with the grace. And now by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.